Hi, I'm Father Jim Martin. I'm a Jesuit priest and editor-at-large of America Magazine, and we are here at the Los Angeles Religious Education Congress talking to one of my favorite spiritual writers, Father Richard Rohr. Thank you for joining us, Richard. My privilege. Thank you, Jim. You have gone from being interviewed uh, by Oprah to interview, being interviewed by me. <laughs> it's a real come down. <laughs> no, no. I agree. Quite the contrary. <laughs> Listen, uh, today we're speaking on the uh, second anniversary of Pope yeah. Francis's election. Two years ago today. Yeah, yeah. and I wanted to yeah. um, ask you just what your reflections on his papacy uh, uh, were and maybe what struck, what struck, in, what struck you about him the most uh, over the last two the years. The most, wow, where do I start? I mean, obviously I'm a huge fan. <laughs> it's like I never thought in my lifetime I would live to see a pope uh, who has confirmed, affirmed so much that so many of us believed about the gospel. And it's clear to me that he is a Jesuit, and what I mean by that is that he puts the gospel first. He, he's, he knows how to be a church man, but the church, of course, doesn't make any sense if it's not communicating the gospel. And I think he does that just brilliantly, in a joyful way, in a challenging way. It's, it's for me everything I could have hoped for and more. <laughs> well, you know, uh, he's similar to you in the sense that he really reaches people, uh, as you do, uh, who are sometimes uh, not enamored of the church or, yeah. or maybe on the fringes of the church or even on the way out of the church. And I'm curious, uh, what is it about your writings that you think that, that reaches people who are struggling uh, with the church? What is it that you, that you offer people who, who may not have a, a, an easy time with the Catholic Church? You know, uh, I always heard that passage is that Matthew's Gospel, preach the Gospel to all nations. Now, the way I heard that was not just get everybody to join our group, but talk to those outside your own nation, you know? And I think what discouraged me as a young seminarian myself, a young Franciscan, was that most of our preaching and teaching was in-house. It was in-house vocabulary, in-house issues, which just kept us at the tribal level. So uh, I, I've always said, how can I make the gospel make sense who have never heard the gospel or, or who have a blockage, which a lot of people do, against uh, Christian language, gospel language. Then the other thing, we Franciscans were always told that our job was not to talk to the elite, but to try to make the gospel make sense to the ordinary person, even the poor person. And you just, you have to change your vocabulary. So I, I still think I'm far too heavy in most of my books, but I still have the desire to give people maybe some good one-liners that they can hold on to, even if they can't hold on to the whole paragraph, because it often is too heavy, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, very much like Jesus. I hope I mean, so. Who, who is preaching to people who may yeah. not have been familiar uh, with the reign of God and with what he was trying to say, and he's trying to grab them you know, in a really good way. Um, you know, your books uh, you know, are so accessible, and yet there's a, there's a real, uh, even if you don't know much about the Franciscan uh, world, there's a real Franciscan spirituality yeah. and ethos that runs through them. Yeah, I hope so. If, if you were trying to explain Franciscan spirituality uh, to someone who had never heard of it before, how would you sum that up for them? You know, what comes to mind uh, and, uh, is the view from the bottom instead of the view from the top reading the gospel from the side of the powerless instead of from the side of power. Not that there isn't a place for the other two. And what I call in my last book, Eager to Love, the integration of the negative. I begin with two quotes that really surprise people from Francis, where he says, uh, do not try to show that you are good. <laughs> uh, it's, it's always coming in the back door in a way. Uh, whereas I would have grown up thinking, well, I got to present a, a proper persona uh, and don't even try to appear good, you know? <laughs> and do not love people because they are good Christians. Love them when they're not good Christians. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's what I call the inclusion of the negative. The, that, and the way I sum that up is that you come to God by doing it wrong more than by doing it right. And that is just counterintuitive, you know. It was popularized, I believe, in our time by Therese of Lisieux, who in many ways, a little flower as we call her, 
has, I think, a Franciscan spirituality, even though she's a Carmelite, because it's always going to be rediscovered. I mean, your father Ignatius had a Franciscan spirituality because he, he understood the view from the bottom in that sense. You know? He did. He wanted to be like Francis. Yes, that was one of his yeah. first impetuses. So it's not really Franciscan. It's just the gospel, you know. And I always say every viewpoint is a view from a point. And our point is to identify with the, those who are pushed to the edge, those who are at the bottom, and read the gospel through their need and their eyes. That the starting point is not sin, ferreting out sin, but the starting point for Franciscan spirituality is go where the suffering is. And that's different. Yeah. Now, do you see that as a, uh, we've given talks on Ignatian and uh, Franciscan mm. spirituality together. Uh, how do you see that as a complement to Ignatian spirituality in your experience? You know, uh, I'm not saying this to flatter you, but uh, the Jesuits have been, starting my early days in Cincinnati, my constant supporters, uh, sometimes more than the Franciscans, although the Franciscans have very much always backed me up. But I think the reason that could easily happen is because you do give good thinking, good words, good analysis. Uh, and I think the, the sort of off the cuff, the way I talk, needs you <laughs> to say it isn't crazy. This isn't just bleeding heart liberalism or cheap opinions of Richard. It might just be the gospel. So I, I do think you brought good thinking and I mean that as a compliment, not uh, to a church that often uh, didn't value good thinking, you know, without, I hope, getting caught in your heads. And for me, that is the compliment that Franciscanism needs. Because, to be perfectly honest, I think we're often uh, characterized by sloppy thinking, you know, Ju maybe just the bleeding heart response, but no ability to say, uh, hey, this is the reason Jesus said this too. You know? Well, I think they both complement one another because I think the Jesuits can be too analytical yeah, yeah. and uh, always trying to discern what does this mean. Yeah, yeah. And the Franciscans, I think, have that kind of openness that to, to sort of just be grateful and to be open and to I be welcoming. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, one of my... Uh, a favorite books of yours is Falling Upwards. Oh, yeah. And it's, uh, I think, the Spirituality for the Second Half of Life. And very briefly, I know it's hard to sum up yeah. a whole book in um, just a few minutes, but how would you characterize the, the movement from uh, the first half of life to the second half of life in a, you in know, a spiritual real shortly, progress? Um, and it's an oversimplification, but it gives a, a trajectory. The first half of life, we create our container, as I call it. You have to build your own ego structure. You have to. We call it your persona or your personality. Uh, we, Merton would call it your false self, but you still have to have it. Building with your reputation, your ethnicity, your religion, your, your good looks or your bad looks, whatever it is that you identify with, it seems we have to do that. Now, if you're able to do that with some degree of satisfaction, okay, I'm, I'm all right, then you're ready to move beyond protecting your container and needing to say, my container is the only true container or the best, and you finally find the contents. What is this meant to hold? What's your life for? You don't want to just keep advertising, I'm an American, I'm a Catholic, I'm male, I'm heterosexual, whatever you want to be. Well, that's what's going to die when you die. You know? <laughs> so you better not put all your eggs in that basket but my argument with so much organized religion, I don't mean to be unfair, but I think a lot of organized religion does the task of the first half of life over and over and over again. Keep assuring you that your identity is the best, yeah, you see? And in the long run, that makes you narcissistic. You, you finally gotta find what's the mission, and what's the message that this education, this identity, this American, uh, freedom that I have. What's it all for? Yeah. So well, churches can become narcissistic in that way too. Absolutely. Yeah, turned inward. Well, Richard, I could listen to you all day, and I just wanted to thank you on behalf of uh, America Magazine, America Media, for joining us. My I want to thank uh, Father Richard Rohr, the Franciscan priest, and uh, at the Center for Action and Contemplation for joining us today. Thank you, Richard. My privilege. God bless thank you. Thank you. Thank you.